Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third live moment of our event, the second plenary of Encontro Paraibano de Professores de Inglês. We are very happy to have you here with us. Thank you for our, yeah, your attendance. My name is Rafaela Souza. I'm from the Federal University of Paraíba, and I will be the, I'll be the moderator of this plenary. During this presentation, you may type questions in the chat. Our speaker has 45 minutes and we'll have 15 minutes for your questions. We are very pleased to have Julianne Hammick from the University of Arizona, who is going to address the topic, English Medium Instruction in Context. Julianne Hammick is the Instructional Design and Development Coordinator at the Center for English as a Second Language at the University of Arizona. She develops courses and teaching materials for English instruction and teacher training. She has an MA in Linguistics from the University of Texas at El Paso and an MA in Second Language Acquisition and Teaching from the University of Arizona. Julian, welcome to our event. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and then we'll get started. Um, here we go. All right. So I'm here today to talk to you about English as a medium of instruction and to kind of explore some of the descriptions that have been made of English medium instruction and what we know about what it takes to be successful in English medium instruction. And spoiler alert, there's a lot more research that is needed on English medium instruction before we can definitively say um, that there is a certain way that we should do it. If you'd like my slides, um, you can access my slides here and you're welcome to follow along. There's some clickable links in the slides. So if you uh, would like to explore those resources, you're welcome to. And I'm gonna use a few acronyms to uh, describe some of these programs that um, are related to content and language being taught together. Um, Content-based instruction, I'll refer to as CBI. Uh, EMI, of course, is English Medium Instruction. I call CLIL <laughs> the acronym for Content and Language Integrated Learning. Um, ICLHE is kind of a mouthful, and that's Integrating Content and Language in Higher Education. And then, of course, uh, HE for referring to higher education itself. And that would be College and University Studies. I'm going to start with a question that, uh, two questions, just to get you thinking about uh, English medium instruction and what happens actually in any classroom where we might teach. What's the role of language in the classrooms where we teach? Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a physics instructor, if you're English as a foreign language instructor. What do we do with language in our classrooms? And then also, what's the role of content in our classrooms? Do we have classrooms where we teach one but not the other? And another spoiler alert, I don't really believe that we do. So before we get to a definition of English medium instruction, um, we th can think back to our own educations possibly or to our experiences in the classroom and think about how language and content interact. And when I started out my career as a teacher, I was an elementary school teacher, primary school. Um, I taught students from ages six to about age 10. And in classrooms like that, language and content are being taught together. Um, students are acquiring literacy in one or, or more than one language. And they're also acquiring, acquiring content, the kind of content that they need to, um, to learn subjects like science, social studies. And as students get older, their classes kind of, at least in the US model of education, their classes become separate. So um, a student will go to physics class and then later they'll go to English language arts classes. And so we, we have the idea that 
as students grow up, their English instruction is, the role becomes different than it was when they're little. But I believe that um, it, language learning, just like learning any kind of information, it's a lifelong process. So um, it doesn't stop when we're 10, doesn't stop when we're 20. <laughs> uh, it doesn't stop when we're the age that I am. So um, we need to come up with a definition of what we're doing when we're doing EMI. And Dalton Puffer uh, provided this quote, and she said that um, labels like CLIL and ICLHE or EMI, they cover such a wide variety of programs um, that they can be very small programs where maybe a few subjects are taught in English. They can be an entire curriculum, an uh, entire program, an entire university model. So we're talking about a lot of stuff here. We're not talking about simply um, one thing that we can easily describe. So a continuum is the way that um, people frequently talk about courses where language and content are both involved in some way. So on the, the opposite ends of this continuum, we've got content-driven instruction on the far left-hand side. So where content plays a central role and language is considered to be the vehicle by which we deliver that content. And then on the right-hand side, we have uh, language-driven models where language acquisition is the goal and content is the vehicle that we use because when we're doing communicative language teaching or when we're, you know, interacting with our students, we've got to talk about something. So we talk about some form of content. And then we have everything in the middle. And that is varying um, combinations of language goals or language acquisition goals and um, desired outcomes for the students. And then content acquisition goals and outcomes for the students. And so within this continuum, we have probably an infinite number of possible program designs. And so when we talk about EMI, generally we're talking about a situation where teachers are teaching content in English. Um, they're professors of various fields, physics, um, urban planning. We have someone in the um, workshop from urban planning, anything basically. And materials we generally think are going to be in English. We can infer that because if instruction is in English, generally in materials, we would, we would expect them to match linguistically, but that's not always the case. So content is explicitly taught in classrooms like, like the ones that um, we describe as EMI. And language might not be explicitly taught in an English medium instruction classroom. We're gonna come back to that point again and again. So although language may not be explicitly taught, English proficiency is frequently cited as a desired result of English medium instruction programs. So um, the reason that these programs are implemented is so that people can acquire a higher proficiency level of English. That's why students sign up. That's why universities, one reason why universities might implement all right, so here is a definition of English medium instruction. And I took this from the British Council Review of English as a Medium Instruction Programs that was published in 2014. But I also saw that the study by Macaro and his colleagues uses um, a definition that's very similar, if not the same. So let's take a look at it. And if this were to be the definition that we used, if we're creating, um, an English medium program at our university or our institution, is it complete? Is it enough for us to, to go on? The use of English language to teach academic subjects in countries or jurisdictions where the first language of the majority of the population is not English. Here's some questions. So when we talk about teaching, what are we teaching? Uh, what teaching approaches um, are used in EMI? What teaching approaches are the uh, effective ones to use in EMI? Who's doing the teaching? Is it the content area specialist or expert, the professor of physics, for example? Or is it a language specialist, a 
an instructor or professor of English as a foreign language who's doing the teaching? Is it both? And how do we prepare people to do this? So what kind of professional development is the kind that will um, prepare people effectively to do this kind of instruction? More questions. When we talk about academic subjects, how do we choose the ones that we're going to, to um, implement EN, EMI in? I had a question from another uh, webinar a few days ago. Um, are there some subjects that lend themselves more easily to EMI than others? Again, I would, I would say that um, more research is needed. Um, I don't think that uh, there's any way to definitively answer that question uh, in a short way. So why do we want to do uh, English medium instruction in content areas? So it's very important for students who are majoring in a, in a particular area to master the content. And so we have to ask ourselves, why are we going to introduce um, an additional dimension to what they have to learn. And who decides? Who chooses the courses that are going to be uh, offered in EMI? So when we get to the, the section about first language, we ask questions about um, if we're offering instruction in a language that's some, not someone's dominant language, then um, what language or what level of language proficiency in English do students need to be successful? What language proficiency do professors need to be successful? What variety of English are we going to teach in the classroom? Um, they're not mutually unintelligible, but it is a choice that, that we would make. And uh, what's the effect of English medium instruction on the languages of the area? So are we creating a situation of diglossia by um, offering instruction in one language, but then carrying out um, other domains of life <laughs> in another language? Are we, um, are we setting English as the, the academic language and at the expense of local languages, which could also do that? So questions that we need to, to think about and answer as we're designing an EMI program. And then we have to think about the population that is going to be involved with this EMI program. So who are the students? Are they local students, domestic students uh, that maybe share a, a common first language? Are they international students, which maybe may have uh, first languages from you know, many, many different types? And who are the teachers? How are we going to select the people who are going to do this EMI instruction? Uh, we already talked about language proficiency, but other, what other qualifications or preparation um, do we look for when we're choosing a person to do English medium instruction. And, you know, we can think about, do the teacher and the students share a common first language? Because if they do, then translanguaging is a possibility. Uh, you know, using the first language to scaffold and to support the instruction in the classroom, you know, is a tool that would be available. But if students don't share a first language, maybe not. So, uh, we're back to our, our basic characteristics of English medium instruction. And I've highlighted the one that says that language might not be explicitly taught in an EMI classroom. And Lister provided these examples um, from interviews um, of content and language uh, specialists, or I guess you would call them <laughs> teachers, who um, are offering some kind of content-based uh, instruction in a language that's not the dominant language of their students. So we have the primary French immersion teacher from Canada who's saying from 9 to 3.30, I don't teach French. I teach subject matter. And French is learned through this content. <laughs> and then we have the ESL social studies teacher from the United States who says, I thought that was someone else's job. And then we have um, the physics EMI professor who says, I don't teach language, I teach physics. And I kind of want to ask that person, um, how, do you, how do you teach physics <laughs> if you're not uh, using language or employing language in some way? So um, this, there, it sounds to me like this person is, you know, is expecting students to, to acquire the language along with the content just by, by nature, by dint of being in the classroom using the language. So, and the, the 
EMI economics teacher in Hong Kong says, I don't think it's necessary to teach them language at all. I won't. So we have this perception that language and content are two things that are separate, can be taught separately, and that um, if you are doing something like EMI and you're a content teacher, some, you, some people may have the perception that um, my, I was hired to teach the content, I wasn't hired or trained to teach the language. So, but an osmosis method of teaching uh, language where you just expect the students to be in the classroom hearing the language, um, using the language, and by that method acquiring the language, it might not give the results that you know, we would like to see. So if the instructors are not kind of um, attracting the students' attention to uh, the language that's involved with the content and students struggle if their if their ability or their I guess proficiency in English isn't enough to allow them to to get the content and get the information by using the second language they will find other ways and so one of the ways that is described is um, semantic processing basically the students will use what they've got available to them to get the meaning out of the materials. And that can include things like um, relying on their background knowledge that they've acquired in their first language, uh, looking at um, you know, context to, to get the meaning that they need. Uh, first language, this, so translation, uh, using you know, all those translation tools that are out there, or language independent ways, students will find other ways to get the information, which means they're, they may be going around the language acquisition part that we thought was just an innate part of EMI. And so um, this can have some fallout, this can have some consequences. So um, EMI courses might revert to a lecture format because that's one that where students um, can rely on their receptive abilities. They can use, you know, translation tools on the slides if it's, you know, a PowerPoint. Um, it also might mean that the the instruction in the classroom becomes more lecture based and less uh, interactive, less communicative, as we use that term in uh, English in, uh, English uh, instruction. So. Um, Students are listening to lectures, students are looking at the slides, students are doing readings, but students may not be interacting with each other. And there are reasons why these things uh, could happen. The creation of language and content silos. So students are, um, are professors are either in the content teacher camp or they're in the language teacher camp and there's an assumption that those two are two separate entities that, that seldom meet. And um, there may be a prioritizing of language or content over language, which if you're a content instructor, you know, you know that your students need to master certain concepts in order to be successful in their major. So, but when we des de um, design EMI programs, we, we can make these kind of choices. So in this uh, TAAC handbook, which is linked in the references, I think it's a really good resource. Um, we can conceive of EMI as just being um, changing language. So only changing language, translating your slides um, to English, providing a textbook that's in English, and that's it. And people conceive of EMI that way. Uh, we can conceive of EMI as being changing language and also changing instruction. So taking a different instructional approach along with uh, using a different language to do the majority of instruction. And then the third one is one that as professors and teachers, we really can't control, which is um, uh, changing the student population also. So we'd like to, to attract international students. That's a priority for a lot of institutions, but as professors, we teach the students who come to our classroom. So. Um, I'm going to focus most on the second one here where changing language and changing teaching style uh, kind of both are integrated in when we design EMI. So um, 
This is another quotation that discusses the fuzziness of the descriptions. So a lot of times we treat EMI as something um, essentially different from CLIL, which would, we may consider essentially different from something like integrating content and language in higher education. But Dalton Puffer says that um, these are really just labels for general, general um, conceptions of programs, but there's a lot of variation even within one of these labels. Um, contextualize actual measures. Um, so in a context, and that's why my talk is called in EMI in contexts, um, programs re respond to their context. So, and so when programs are implemented, they tend to um, start to look or take on characteristics that are related to the students that they're teaching, the instructors who are doing the teaching. And so it's contextualized and each program is kind of its own um, creation. So. <laughs> We're gonna take a look at two um, programs. These are two case studies, two case studies out of many case studies of EMI from two parts, different parts of the world. And the reason that I wanna do this is I wanna see that the choices that we make in design um, can have ramifications in the classroom that make the program start to look very different. So the first one is Hu and Lei from 2014, and that's from a university in China. And the second one is a university in Catalonia, um, and it's by Cots in 2013. So like I said, there are many, um, case studies out there. And all I'm going to do is provide a very rudimentary, very brief um, review of some of the points of each one. So in some cases, these interventions or these program models or what's being done is pretty small scale, especially in the case of the tandem teaching that I'm gonna talk about. So th these, this is not a comprehensive review of what's happening in AMI is my point. And the two case studies I chose both had a lens. They, they used the uh, lens of language policy. So that's what they looked at. And they may not have examined some of the other features of these programs that might also be interesting to look at. So here's the Hu and Lei um, case study about the Chinese university. So at this university, they had a small number of international students, pretty small, 1.5%. Um, the English medium instruction instructors who were chosen were those who had taken a degree at a university that was an English speaking university. Um, they'd studied overseas in some way. That seemed to be the um, default characteristic or the, the characteristic that um, was most prevalent among those instructors. And this university had an exponential growth of EMI, or actually the entire country of China had an exponential growth of EMI. EMI is a hot, is a hot topic in China. So, um, and English proficiency is very um, valued. So it's very important and it's a, it's a marker of prestige to have a level of English proficiency. So at this university, some courses were delivered in Mandarin and some courses were delivered in English. So there was an EMI option but there was a parallel option that was delivered in uh, Mandarin Chinese. And some of the things that, that started to happen were um, students who were selected for the program had IELTS scores below 6.5, so that's below B2 approximately uh, in the Common European Framework. So they were probably pretty challenged by having an all English curriculum. Um, the instructors were prepared to do this English medium instruction. They were given a few symposia, some lectures that they attended on doing EMI, and that's how they were prepared for the instructional part of doing EMI. And these researchers noticed that there was a lot of translanguaging going on in the classroom. So um, a lot of navigating between English and Mandarin Chinese um, in the classroom itself. And because the students were limited in English proficiency and the teachers were not confident of their own 
English proficiency in some cases. The results in the classroom that they saw were that um, the lectures or the lessons became very lecture focused, not interactive. Um, there was a heavy reliance on doing reading and using texts and using PowerPoint slides to deliver the content. And there was a minimal amount of spontaneous interaction. So um, the limitations of proficiency, the, the, how should we say, moderate preparation of the, the professors in EMI teaching practices resulted in a classroom that used a lot of Chinese, which is not a bad thing uh, in and of itself, but in this case, it was probably not what they had expected when they started to implement EMI. So maybe these results were not desirable for uh, the people in, at the university who decided that they were going to, to, to do EMI. And so Hu and Lei concluded that um, there's, a, in terms of language policy, English is very valuable as a skill, as uh, something that will get you employment or educational prospects. And so it was, it was valued very highly, but possibly also pretty uncritically. And I like this term hiatus. So there was a, there was a disconnect between the goals of the EMI program, which would be things like language proficiency and mastering the content. There was a disconnect between that and what happened in the classroom. And why was there disconnect, a disconnect like that? Probably a lot of reasons, but the pre preparation of the instructors and the lack of confidence of these instructors and also the language proficiency of the students probably all played a role there. Um, uh, there was a misalignment between the policy and what students and faculty actually needed to be successful. And um, this resulted in what they called a perpetuation of educational inequalities. So the students who were able to participate successfully in these EMI programs were students who had had um, opportunities to acquire English to a high level of proficiency. Um, students who had not had those um, opportunities were less successful or they didn't participate at all. So that's unfortunate. And um, we're going to move on to Catalonia, which is our second um, case study example. And this is a university that is um, asking or it's it's trying to increase its international student population. So the student population um, is primarily students from the area, but also an increasing number of international students, more than at the Chinese university, as far as I could tell. So a higher level of international students. That means that the students in a classroom might ha not have a common first language, okay? Um, many of the instructors also had overseas study experience, much like the Chinese example. Um, there are relatively few EMI programs of this type in that area, so it isn't as prevalent, according to, these, to this researcher, as it is in China. So it's maybe less established in this area. Um, the goal was multilingualism. So that's a little different focus from saying that um, that English is prioritized as it as was described in the Chinese example. Multilingualism is prioritized. And you can start to see that that might change um, actions in the classroom and practices. And there are three languages of instruction at this university. And the researcher states that they did expand to, to offer more options. But Catalan, which is the language of the area, and Spanish, which is the national language, um, and also English. So instead of Mandarin and uh, English, they've got three uh, options to choose from. And this program mandated monolingual classroom instruction. So where translanguaging was happening to a high degree at the, the university in China, here the, the idea was that that would be avoided. Um, so the first year students were pretty similar to um, the students that we saw for the Chinese uh, example. B1 English approximately. Um, international students were perceived to be higher or better or 
higher levels of English proficiency than the domestic students or the local students were. So there's already kind of a you know, distinction between international students and uh, students from the area as far as who they thought had a higher level of English proficiency, whether or not that was true. Um, and students, or sorry, instructors were prepared to do this in a number of ways, but this study focused on a pilot, which was tandem instruction. So this was a small scale uh, project where uh, one content area instructor and one language instructor worked together to uh, teach a class in the uh, content area that was, uh, that was being taught. So it was a small scale thing. It was only two teachers. It wasn't the practice of you know, the entire department or the entire university. So what they saw in the classroom was that having those two teachers working together um, resulted in a program or a classroom practice that was more student-centered, more student-centered, not less. And then it was more interactive because you had two people working together who had been trained in very different ways in instruction, but they kind of contributed their knowledge and they were able to work out the roles in the classroom. What would the content area be teacher, teacher be doing at this point? What would the language teacher be doing at this point? And so it required a lot of work, but um, according to the researcher, this is what the result was. It was improved in terms of communicative practice in the classroom. And Kotz concludes that um, the institution itself, the university where this happened, was a little bit, um, maybe, it's, they use the word ambiguous, but I might use the word ambivalent. Um, on one hand, they want to promote English medium instruction at the university. On the other hand, in a lot of cases, um, the resources to do that were not provided to the content teachers. And that's why this, this little pilot tandem teaching study was conducted to see if that would be effective. So there's a little bit of, again, a disconnect between what the policy is and how it's put into practice. So interesting that two studies from two different parts of the world kind of uh, come to the same conclusion about that. And there was a disagreement, of course, about English proficiency required for success um, for both teachers and students. And there, I think I cited the Macaro study. I have it in the references at the end here. The Macaro study came to the same conclusions that we don't really have enough research to say that you must have a certain, this particular level of link English proficiency to be a successful EMI student or teacher. So more research is needed in that area too. And they also, uh, this uh, researcher also came to the conclusion that tandem teaching, it is a possible way forward, but um, it has its own challenges. So the first one is that these two instructors obviously were trained very differently. So being trained as a, as a language teacher, you know, the, the methods, the theory, is very different from someone um, who is trained to teach a content area in their field. So they're kind of from different cultures, you might say. And that can create some conflict. It can create a little bit of tension, um, especially when deciding how to design a lesson, how to conduct a lesson. Um, so it's a possibility that that could happen. Tandem teaching is expensive. You've got two teachers instead of one. And it's also not something that's very well established at Spanish universities, according to this researcher. Um, and they said that um, this might result in the community really not accepting a tandem teaching model as easily as it might be in a place where it's more common. And tandem teaching ended up not being um, pursued by this university, although they did notice that there were some improvements in classroom instruction as a result of this tandem teaching pilot, it wasn't adopted at the university. So we can look at the contextual factors here um, that led to what eventually ended up happening in the classroom. So where professors were not confident in their ability to teach in English and where the uh, support maybe was not as robust as it could have been, um, 
it led to things like the content being simplified. So if a concern of the content teacher is that they've got to make sure that their students master these concepts, if those concepts have to be simplified in order for them to be comprehensible, then that content teacher is going to have some concerns, and so are the students. And, but they did see that as a result. Um, the, another result was, as we said, more lecture and less interactive action, less discussion in the classroom, and there was more use of those, those other strategies which are like um, less linguistic, so that the students are not thinking in English and using English to do things. They're trying to find ways around um, doing the work in English because they need to, they need to pass the class. And so in Catalonia, the contextual factors, some of them were similar, but what they noticed is that those two teachers working together, this interdisciplinary collaboration resulted in going from looking at texts as transparent. And what this means is that um, it's the assumption that the words on the page say what they say and you either understand them or you don't. That's text is transparent. So the words are there. All you have to do is look at them and read them and then they go into your head. Shifting from that kind of conceptualization to one of text is opaque. Text is something you actually have to look at and figure out. So a text is something that you study. How does an academic article work? How is it arranged? What do the headings do? What parts should you read first? What parts should you read last? So going from just the textbook is just the delivery of information um, tool to a textbook is something, or any kind of text, um, something that you can actually study and learn how to improve your comprehension of. So that shift happened, um, instructor-centered shift. So instructor-centered meaning lecture-based classes. It turned from that into something where um, students were more active in the classroom, which you know we would consider a positive thing. And a shift from the idea that my job is to transfer information to, into your brain to the idea that students should construct some of this knowledge on their own. So, um, and this quote down here is interesting because it says that um, the reason some of this happened is because, or one of the benefits of this happening is that teachers needed to be less concerned about their ability to lecture in English because the students were doing more of the knowledge construction so um, it took some of the burden, the linguistic burden off the instructors by shifting it to a student-centered model. I thought that was really fascinating. Okay, so I've said research is needed, research is needed at, uh, at several points and um, research is needed. So what levels of English proficiency would make a student successful? Um, what's the effect of EMI on English language proficiency if students are involved? We would expect it to improve as a result of participating, but um, there is some research, perhaps not enough. And also, what are the effects of using an EMI um, model on content learning? Do students learn the same content to the same level of depth as a result of being in EMI? And I do see your questions here. Um, I'd like to maybe um, go through them at the end of the talk, if that's okay. So I'm not ignoring the questions. All right, and also how do we design these models? How do we design an EMI program that will work at our institution? And so Makaro and his colleagues uh, have kind of set a research agenda for that too. So what are the competencies that would make someone um, a successful EMI instructor? And um, how is language acquired in a classroom like this? And how is it used in a, in a classroom like this? Um, and then there's the problem of the nomenclature again. So what do we call these kind of programs? So the naming seems to be pretty idiosyncratic in, in a lot of cases. But Makaro and his colleagues uh, came to these three conclusions. The first one, of course, is stakeholders need to be involved when these programs are being developed and when they're being implemented. Um, that would be students, professors, the community of the area. Um, 
Okay. And second one is pedagogy needs to change. So the, the teaching methods involved in EMI need to be different from the teaching uh, methods that are employed in a typical content lecture-based classroom. What that would look like? We need more research. So, and the need for collaboration, interdisciplinary collaboration is important in an EMI program. So not, no one instructor of anything has probably had the life experience, the work experience, the academic training to um, know everything that is needed to be known um, about language acquisition and language teaching and the content area that's involved. Um, so drawing on the expertise of your colleagues is an important part of successful EMI implementation. And my takeaway messages are that successful EMI, uh, it's not a formula. So it needs to respond to its context, which is why involving stakeholders is important, um, both in the planning and the policy and also how it's implemented in the class. We've got to support the instructors. So instructors need to be prepared to do EMI. It's not something that you can do because you speak English necessarily. So there's more involved and we need to realize that the workload will be increased because adding English language instruction to a content class adds another dimension to the, to the teaching of that class. It's more work, it requires more preparation. So we need to support the instructors and recognize that. We need to support the students. We need to recognize that um, their level of proficiency may affect how they go about learning in the classroom. We need to scaffold the language. We need to um, provide opportunities for them to use the language to make meaning in the content area that they're studying. And of course, that interdisciplinary collaboration is really important and I think that that's the key. So we need to create a community of EMI practice at our institutions and also in uh, situations like this where there are people from all over the world who are interested in EMI and we can have discussions like that here as well. So I like to end my talks with quotations and this is a quotation from a Finnish American um, architect, Eliel Saarinen, and he said, always design a thing by considering it in its next larger context, a chair in a room, a room in a house, a house in an environment, in an environment in a city plan. So designing something without considering where it's going to be, um, Saranen would say that that would not be successful design. So thank you very much um, for this opportunity to talk with you today. And now we can take a look at all your questions. Thank you so much, Julianne. Uh, we are really happy to, to have this topic covered in our conference because every day we come across these acronyms, CLEO, EMI, and we have to go deeper and see the differences, what uh, research says. Yeah, And we have selected some comments here. Um, let me read the first one. Just a second. Uh, Camila mentions that the institutions in Brazil are struggling to understand how to implement EMI. So these contexts that you have mentioned in China, uh, in Catalonia, in, in the Catalonia, yeah, the, the second one you mentioned. Mm -hmm. These are great uh, uh, explanations and examples for us. And the second one I have here is, uh, was made by Ana Carolina. And she mentions that, uh, actually it's a question. What can be done when students do not have the required level of English to follow the classes? This is, this made the case of most students in Brazil. Sure, so, um like I said in the, in the lecture, students find ways to understand what's there, but it may not be what we want. So um, a lot of this kind of scaffolding and language support strategies, um, structured English, we have one in, in uh, the United States called SIOP, SIOP, 
structured, uh, <laughs> good Lord, um, structured immersion observation protocol. And um, basically it's methods of supporting someone who is acquiring English at the same time that they're doing uh, content study. And um, so language instructors have been trained in this. It's, it's one more reason that we would incorporate um, a language teacher into the design of the program and possibly the teaching of the courses. Um, when I was started out teaching, I taught English language learners at the US-Mexico border. And so this is what we would do. Um, strategies like um, questioning, using a graphic organizer as you're listening to something, translanguaging, drawing upon the first language to support acquisition of the second language. Um, it's not a bad thing um, if it's used in a way that supports the students in their instruction, but also helps them advance in their language proficiency in the second language. So um, I would really just draw upon the expertise of the language experts at your institution. Mm -hmm. And what kinds of advice would you have for the language specialist who's working with professionals from other areas, like you are working in the area of medicine or you are working there, engineering? What would be the role of this profession? Yeah, that's a good question. So as in instructional design, we always assume that uh, the instructional designer is not going to know the content and that they're going to be working with the content specialist. So, and the content specialist will know the content, but maybe need support with the instructional part, the, de the design of the course part. And so you recognize that those two roles are different and that each one of them contributes in a really important way to designing the course, designing the lessons. And um, you try to, um, like we said before, in the situation in Catalonia, there can be tensions because the approaches might be different and the assumptions about learning might be very different, but it needs to be a dialogue and it needs to recognize that uh, both of those parts are important and they need to find ways to work together. Uh, Camila asks, do you understand that EMI methodology would have to be accommodated into the language policies and the goals of the institution. And EMI would vary depending on the context. Yeah, I think that, you know, that was, you know, one of the big points I did want to make. Mm -hmm. um, institutional mandates have to be responsive to the situation um, of the students and the situation of the instructors. So that's why Makaro and his colleagues said that the stakeholders need to be involved in the design of these, these programs. Mm -hmm. Context is key. Yes. And Jessica Moraes said that, uh, I had the opportunity to teach students from different nationalities. And for me, not having the L1 support was quite challenging uh, while I was teaching, especially with upper levels. Mm -hmm. Uh, Heidi mentions that uh, she had the opportunity to work with EMI classes at the medical faculty where I worked in Kyrgyzstan uh, and it was the same, PPT heavy and very much undirectional in the lectures and many of the students were from countries like India, Bangladesh and Pakistan where they, speak, they can speak English and students felt very demotivated. Yeah, I can understand why that would be. So mm -hmm. if you've got the resources, draw upon those resources, right? So if you have students who can model English language uh, interaction and things, incorporate that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Lucas Peixoto mentions that uh, in the genesis of communicative approach, teaching grammar used to be a big no such as it happens with Clio. Mm -hmm. Does that compromise metalinguistic thinking, which is essential to develop learn-to-learn -learn skills? Yeah, as far as uh, grammar teaching in an EMI class, um, the thing is that with EMI, you're trying to do 
a lot more in the same amount of time. I think that there might be other uh, areas of language that might be more effectively taught and it, that might make a more natural match with the content that's involved. So for example, um, in the workshops that we did and uh, the webinar that I did on Wednesday, we um, talked about using the common European framework descriptors as a, a starting point for creating language objectives for a content class. And I gave an example of one which is students at a B1 level can talk about um, data. So they can see like a diagram or a chart with data and they can discuss that um, in, I guess, an intermediate way with some, um, maybe some hesitation, some disfluencies like I'm having right now. Um, but that's actually an, a descriptor that's in the Common European Framework. And those things more closely match what they're going to be doing with their instructor anyhow. So if they've done a lab activity and they've got some data and maybe it's been arranged in some kind of chart, then it's a natural next step to say, um, okay, our language objective is to discuss this data, to identify the trends in the data, identify um, maybe outliers. That is a more close match than having the EMI teacher teaching grammar, for example. I think that that probably would be better handled somewhere else. Mm -hmm. yeah, Lucas Peixoto uh, sent us a second comment saying that, uh, I find it troubling to think that students may achieve proficiency without working with accuracy or learning how to think about language and how to observe it. Yeah. So it's, uh, you have to, keep a balance yeah yeah i agree yeah. and uh could you go deeper uh, in the differences I, uh, you've mentioned some concepts but uh in a short word how would you differ clio and emi <laughs> um i kind of you could probably infer from what i said earlier that um i don't think that there is an absolute difference. I think it may be, we may talk about it in terms of the percentage that's devoted to focusing on language versus focusing on content. So perhaps we could say that in an EMI class, there is, it's predominantly focused on the content that's involved, but in a CLIL class, um, it may be more balanced, as we said, although as we said, saw with those quotations about terminology, um, CLIL is used in some situations where you might expect EMI to be the, the way that it's described. So the terminology isn't absolute and there are not clear distinctions. Um, but if we think about it in a general way, I think that the amount of focus on language and content might be considered to be different. Uh, Ruth Eduardo asks, uh, Professor Hemick, Paulo Freire wrote in his books that students are the main part in the education process and the teacher is the one who will lead the way to knowledge. Do you agree with that? I do agree. Um, I don't think that that's um, maybe the way that institutions run sometimes, but um, I do believe that students come in with, you know, ideas. They've got a goal. They have um, things that they'd like to achieve. And we should be the people who facilitate them getting there. Um, and we need to kind of find a way, ways to make that more real than maybe it is sometimes. Okay, I think uh, we've covered the comments and I've added some questions as well. But thank you very much for uh, sharing your knowledge about EMI with us. Yeah, and Ep is very happy to have you here. I'm so happy to have the opportunity to be here with you. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> and for our attendees, we are going to have a break. It's a virtual coffee break, right? And we'll be back 
at 3.30. Okay, thank you. Thank See you, you later. Bye.